Andrei Rublev. He was a Russian Orthodox priest. He lived, as you can see, in 1360 to 1430. That's about 100 years before our guy, Martin Luther. All right, just historical reference. But he took this Genesis 18 reading that you heard of Abraham and his encounter with these three visitors, the Lord, under the great trees of Mamre. And he made this now famous icon of the Trinity. Now, you may wonder, well, what's the deal with icons? It's not something we do in our Lutheran church, but in the Orthodox church, it's a big deal. An icon is meant to draw a person in to the knowledge, the experience, and the worship of God. The depictions aren't meant to be accurate renderings of anything uh, like you'd see in a photograph, but they are pictures rich in symbolism, drawing out all kinds of biblical references to call to your mind as you sit and stare and think about what is going on in the picture. And so as you look at this picture, you'll see the three figures, and to the left, You'll see that colors mean something in, in the icon. The person seated on the left is the father, and he wears a golden shimmering robe for the glory of God. But there's also a blue undershirt that he's wearing. And you'll notice that each of the three figures wear this same color of blue, for they each three share the divinity. You'll notice that each figure's face is identical. And Rublov would have us focus then that while the Trinity is three distinct persons of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they are but one God. As we look to the right, we see the Holy Spirit. And He is wearing an outer green garment, for the Spirit brings life and faith to the world. You'll notice, though, that His head, along with the one seated in the center, is bowed to the Father. It's not that there is a hierarchy in the Trinity, but in reverent submission out of love, they bow to the Father. You'll notice that in each hand there is a scepter of the same size, for they together rule heaven and earth. The figure in the middle, he wears a blood-red robe for his humanity and, of course, the divinity of blue. This God-man is Jesus. Notice his fingers are making the sign, the peace sign, the, the peace of Christ. But it's not only the persons of the Trinity, but there are other things to draw us into worship and the experience. If you look over the head of the Father, you'll see a kind of rudimentary house the focus isn't the splendor of the house, but its doors. The doors are absent. It, the house is open. Anybody could just come in and go out of the Father's house. Over the shoulder of Jesus, you'll see one of the great trees of Mamre foreshadowing the great tree of His crucifixion. And over the Holy Spirit, you'll see a desolate mountain. It is the mountain of faith in which the Spirit will enable us by His guidance and strength to traverse this mountain of faith. Well, the reason that I wanted to share with you Rublov's Trinity icon was that we together might be drawn into this experience of God, but also to see what's going on at the table. Three are seated around this table, but there is a space, an open space, and this is on purpose because that is a space for you. The Trinity is inviting you into their space and their table. It is the Spirit then who will come for us and enable us to traverse this mountain, narrow path of faith and the Son who will give His life into death on that tree that we might receive the hospitality of God right now. That we're welcome at that table, and not only at that table now, but as we make our way through this life of faith with the Son and the Spirit, it is the Father's house that is open to us, and there forever be a family. See, God has always been extending His hospitality. He has, 
so desired you individually and personally that he created this entire universe that he might have us. And he created it in such a way that it is beautiful, warm, and inviting. Creating it in such a way that, well, there, it, it is inspiring vistas and good food and good things. God did not have to make this world as beautiful as it is. But all of the extras, all of the wonderfulness, this luxurious brings out his hospitality. So that our hospitality, as we extend it to one another, God finds it extremely pleasing for it is an extension of his welcome and his love and his inclusion of the outsider into his family. Now, as we've learned each week in our Find Out series that it's never accomplished to please God simply by uh, learning, well, what behaviors does he want us to do? What are the rules? And then trying hard to do them. It's never accomplished without the right heart. And this heart and this guide to that kind of heart, we're, we're going to turn our attention to the New Testament, to Mary and Martha. Martha. And there we find a very rich and luxurious welcome extended to Jesus. And not only to Jesus, but, you know, he had 12 friends with him. And it's not just 12 friends, that Jesus always had a large crowd of people coming and going and, oh, what's for dinner? You know, oh, can we stay the night? And this is a large imposition on Mary and Martha, and yet they don't grumble. There is a joy in opening their homes their tables, and their lives. In fact, Martha seems to be kind of made for the challenge. You know, all right, how many we got for supper tonight? All right, we can do this. We'll take that mountain. And often when this reading is presented to a crowd as a sermon or a Bible study, I know that quite often the, the preacher or the, or the leader wants people to kind of take a side. Are you a Mary or are you a Martha? You know, and the whole point of kind of determining which one you are at, at the end of the sermon is so that you'll try and be like the other one. I know. But rather than spending all this time tonight trying to figure out if you're a Mary or a Martha, set aside all that self-identification, uh, and we're going to do something new with the text. And see what hospitality there is what we can learn of hospitality. And it may surprise you, although initially it does seem that Martha does everything right. I mean, she opens her home and she goes to work right away making a meal for this large and ever-growing crowd. And you would think, okay, hospitality 101, be nice and feed everyone. Okay. That, that seems like the thing, and so that's what Martha was about. And yet, Jesus calls her out by name, Martha, Martha. Wait a minute, maybe we missed something here. Well, let's go back to it. What was she doing again? She, was, she opened her home, didn't have to do that, all the expense, and she was preparing a meal. I, I've yet to see kind of where she's gone wrong, and yet she has gone drastically wrong, so far wrong that Jesus has to correct her. For it's not her behavior or her actions, but it is her heart that has gone way off course. You see, Martha is busy doing all of these activities, not with a heart filled with joy and for the sake of serving other people. Martha is taking care of Martha's needs to be the one who never lets them go hungry, the one who can open a home to how many people, the one who saves the day. And there her heart is a little bit exposed, but it's going to be even more so. Because when you look at Mary, Mary's doing the exact same thing. Mary's taking care of Mary's needs. What Mary wanted to sit down and listen to Jesus, and so She's just going to sit there. I don't care if supper comes and goes. I'm just going to be with Jesus. 
Well, why is it so simple and easy to see other people's failures and shortcomings rather than our own? And Martha saw this, and she shames her sister in front of the entire audience that's there. She then takes Jesus, involves him in the conflict, and says it may be even part of your problem too, Jesus. You tell her to come and help me. Hospitality 101, do not have a family squabble in front of your guests. Do not make the guests pick a side of who's right and who's wrong, and don't blame the guests, all right? All of this revealed what was really going on in the heart of Martha. And inside her heart, she was about the task of justifying herself. It is in her hospitality that she found that she had worth. I'm doing this so that I can have rest at night knowing that I'm a good person, that I've done good things. I can then feel not only good about me, but then I know that I have value and worth. And as we hear what's going on in her heart, why we kind of see, well, I kind of think that way too sometimes in what I do and what I want to be seen by other people as doing. And, and that's the problem. All of this is covered over uh, in our hearts with the good things that we do and that we could, we really don't see this self-justification of, of what I'm doing so that I can be thought of in my own eyes as good. And then once we do kind of clear the dust and, and we can see what's going on, then we kind of wonder, well, why is that so bad? I mean, is that really that big a crime that Jesus has to stop everything? Martha, Martha. I mean, if she really jumped off the ship that far, there, there's some bigger sins I'm sure Jesus could have focused on. And yet, while Martha could not see the, how inhospitable she had made her home by calling out her sister, while we normally cannot see why this would be such a big crime, Jesus gently draws us into the truth and the light you see, such a heart is inhospitable to God, and it has no room for Him and His ways. Such a heart does not love God or other people the way it loves itself. Such a heart is simply serving itself. And that is the very kind of heart that Jesus has come to change. You see, Jesus isn't as concerned about hospitality, but the relationship that we have with the triune God. And so, uh, as we feast our eyes on this icon, as we consider again that the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, has created all of this, this beautiful day we've had, the health that we have in our bodies, the joy that we have gathering in this worship service, the beautiful things that we see and the rich music that we can hear, all of this has but one purpose, that we might have the Father's welcome at the table, that we might know in our hearts just how deeply and dearly we are loved. So as we consider then how our hospitality pleases the Lord, as we consider what kind of heart that we truly have, it's not obvious or immediate. It takes a moment to ask yourself the question, why am I doing this? When I'm asked to provide hospitality, why do I not want to do it? You know, a lot of us really don't open our homes that much. And when we're asked to do something, we kind of drag our feet. When we're asked to forgive, when we're asked to be merciful, when we're asked to care about the needs of another person, and then when we do finally do something, we want credit for it. 
Yeah, I am a pretty hospitable person. What Jesus would invite us to do, the Spirit himself coming down, the green of life, greening our hearts from the stone coldness to a new life that would present before God, why am I doing what I do? Why am I resisting? Why am I trying to take credit? And there as our hearts are before God, we see the great tree of Mamre on which our Savior would eventually die. And we're reminded of the forgiveness of our sins. And the Spirit then takes this, this confession of, of why don't I and begins to work in us a new life that we simply might care and love for one another out of the Father's love, His open house, His open doors, His open love for us, that it might work in us that same kind of simple extension of hospitality for another person simply because they need it. There's a meal to be prepared. There's a person to forgive. There is a need to be met simply because that person needs it. That's the kind of invitation that we have from our God. That's the kind of people that he's making. And the more and more time we spend with this God, the more and more the Spirit leads us down that desolate mountain, the narrow path of walking with our Savior to the Father's house. So our, our spiritual practice for this coming week is, with hospitality is to celebrate Sounds like a, a fun spiritual practice. Sign us up for that. And it, it can be done in so many different ways, but the simplest is to throw a party, share a meal, feast and enjoy God's provisions of life to the fullest with others. Yeah, this one's much easier than fasting, right? <laughs> well, this card will be available for you then on, as you leave uh, church today and and I pray that, that all of the spiritual disciplines that we've been invited into, they, they build on each other. You can bring one back, do one again. And it's, it's simply the Spirit working in us. You may even want to spend some time contemplating and thinking deeply about this icon and the Father's welcome and hospitality. So alone, to God be the glory. Amen.